don't need you. Right? Then you think, okay, I'm really hungry, and I know it's going to be rude, but I've got to get out of here to satisfy my hunger. Cortex says, cortex gives a message to the, and it needs to be a strong message. Okay, I won't, because that would be rude. But now I'm really hungry, and I also need to go to the washroom, and so I'm building my reasons to need to have this behavior. Right? And so the cortex, once there's a sufficiently strong message, right, the cortex turns on another layer of the basal ganglia, which turns off the output, and therefore the central pattern generators are on. And that's called disinhibition. Is that clear or really confusing? <laughs> okay, now I'm actually going to skip right over this next slide because it's actually repetitive, um, and so I'm not going to go there. The main thing clinically that I want to give you in terms of central pattern generators is in terms of the sensory inputs that demand of phase transition. So what is it that makes us know that we need to have the central pattern generator of extension stand and then allows us to know, no, we want to turn that off and have flexion of swing. Because mm -hmm. if you think, okay, now I hear that central pattern generators are an important thing to create stance in a limb and then swing in the limb. And I should actually make it clear here that central pattern generators are for art limb. So from the central pattern generator perspective, the extensor half circle is stance of the left, and the same central pattern generator then creates flexion of the left. Right? It's not that one central pattern generator creates it extension for one and swing of the other. From the central pattern generator perspective, it's to a limb. All right, that's really important, I think. So there's a solid scientific basis for recognizing that stance of a limb influences swing of the next, which influences stance of the next in the one limb. I think classically as therapists, we're really aware that stance of one influences swing of the other, but not necessarily as aware of the intralimb. So what is it that allows us to turn on and off the appropriate flexor half circle? Now, if this confuses you, go to the next slide, which is really the words explaining this. So some people learn by words, and some people learn by diagram. Essentially here, I'm going to start here. So in stance, there is an important sensory afferent of load. Load is transmitted by group 1 extensor afferents, which is muscle spindle Golgi tendon, and cutaneous. So we know we've got load through a limb by mechanoreceptors in our feet and by the information coming from the Golgi, spin Golgi tendon organ muscle spindle of the musculature of the limb, particularly in the literature talked about in terms of the musculature around the um, ankle. That load turns on the extensor half center of the central pattern generator. So we've got stance. Then, having had stance, we then get a position signal 1A muscle spindle, particularly from the hip flexors, particularly from the hip flexors, that say we've now got a stretch of the hip flexors and now we need to bring about activation of the flexion central, uh, half center of the central pattern generator to allow swing. At the same time as having the length through the hip flexors, you've got the losing of the load information. All right? So in words, the most important sensory afferent to create stance is about load. Mm 
And the most important sensory information to create swing is about unload and lengthen the hip flexors. So now think about a patient that you treated today and ask yourself the question, when they walk, do they receive all of those sensory afferents in an appropriate manner? Did they get true hip extension? Or do they get their pelvis back with their hip? And actually, the hip stays in flexion. Load is not just about force. Load isn't force. And I think this is a huge problem with a lot of the force platform literature. Right? So load is about active creation of anti-gravity, not pressure bearing into a scale. So did your patient, when they walked, load the limb by rising up over the limb, or do they fall down into it and off it and deviate in a plane so that they're not over the foot? That's not an appropriate load signal to bring about the extensor half, half center of central pattern generated activity. So if they don't have that, the central nervous system's not turning on the rhythmical patterned activity, so they've got to think about how to walk and compensate with another strategy. Or turn it around, if you can influence that information, then you can allow them to access their central pattern generators. And that might change their locomotion. Now, the next slides are really speaking to what I've just said to clinically there. So I'm not going to harbor on them, but muscle spindle and Golgi tendon are going to two hugely important uh, ways of perceiving load. Right. I won't go there, sorry, it's a bit. And as I said also, so is the cutaneous mechanoreceptors of the foot. And Tim Inglis has done a lot of really excellent work looking at the mechanoreceptors of the foot in the lab out here at, at uh, UBC. He's probably one of the world's leading experts looking at, looking at that in terms of at, in humans. Um, so lots of good work coming out from there, looking at how low, looking at how load is, we're informed of load through cutaneous mechanoreceptors. And they found that they are distributed over the entire foot. They're not just bunched in one place. They are over the entire foot. And they've also found that the slower adapting, I always have to remember which ones, I always forget which ones. The slower adapting, the Ruffini and the Merkel disc. So here, Ruffini in the deeper and Merkel disc in the more superficial. Uh, are the um, most important cutaneous mechanoreceptors for picking up load. And the 1A muscle spindle afferents in the hip flexors. This is, this is to highlight what I've said in terms of central pattern generator is, is for each limb. And one of the things that I discovered reading for this lecture that I hadn't actually recognized. I, I had incorrectly seen central pattern ge generated activities as being about walking forwards, right? And actually not recognized that it, they are now speaking to, and I don't know if this is, I just missed it or if it's newer in the literature, but they are now speaking 